So what I'm going to talk about is uh, joint work with Andreas Krause at uh, ETA Zurich and his student uh, uh, Mario Lucic, and Amin Karbasi, who was a postdoc with Andreas and now who is at Yale. Um, and, and clearly, from the title, you can already see that we will have lots of common themes with what Sham said, and there will be also differences. So I'm going to not explicitly comment on them mostly, unless you have, you have a question, then I can actually go ahead and elaborate more about how the two things relate. The idea is that we want to talk about computation statistics trade-offs. And, and really, what is, the, what is at stake here? So we are very used to thinking of data as a statistical resource. So more data gives you a naturally lower statistical risk. But typically, we think of data as a computational hindrance. More data is going to actually make life difficult for you. So the, par the paradigm in which we want to think is, can data be thought of as a computational resource? Can more data actually drive down your computational cost? So this is the general thinking, and the roots of this go far, far back. In fact, uh, Cervelio, I don't know, I know he's here, but I don't, I'm not sure he's in the room right now. Uh, they had thought about all these ideas, and I'm going to talk to you today about a slightly different version of that. But let's make this gradually more precise, so one step at a time. So unlike what Sham said, so let's compare a tiny bit, I'm not going to think about competing with DRM. I'm going to fix a certain risk tolerance, which many applications is what you want. So you, you say, I want to guarantee a certain statistical risk. So with that statistical risk is associated the sample complexity of the learning or estimation problem, below which, if you have less data than that, you cannot solve the problem. Now, once you are above that point, Typically, you choose an estimation algorithm. It's going to have certain running time. So here I'm plotting running time versus data size. But as you increase the data size, typically this algorithm is going to require more and more time. It also is going to give you less and less risk. But we don't care. We only care about guaranteeing the epsilon risk. Now, what you can do, given this algorithm, is you can just take it and truncate your data and use it as is. And that's going to give you this flat line in terms of it's some computation statistics trade-off. You're just truncating uh, uh, your, your algorithm. But it's somewhat trivial. What we're asking more here is whether we can have, we can do some, so once you go beyond the sample complexity, once you have more data than you need, can you leverage the fact that you have more data in order to drive the computational cost down? And does there exist such an algorithm? So does there exist a non-trivial trade-off? Okay. So. Let's, but why would we expect to be able to even do this? Where, where, where do we get the gain? Where does the computational gain come from? So, so for this, I'm going to go back to the classical bias variance picture. So our truth is somewhere out there. And we choose a model class, as is typically done in learning and, and stats. And the first item here is that we want to, to find the best element in our model class to describe the truth. I'm going to make this very precise in the context of k-means in a few seconds. But for now, let's just think ab abstractly to see what's happening. Now, of course, we don't have access to even the, uh, the, the truth to be able to find the best in, best in class. All we have is data. And based on that data, we make an estimation. And that's going to incur some variance. So here, variance, I'm using it not literally as a variance, but it's, it refers to the estimation error. So with more. So, so let's say now we hit the right risk, error, risk tolerance. What's happening typically in the statistical problem is that with more data, we can actually get lower estimation error. And we create a margin here, a gap between the estimation, the, 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 the risk that we can tolerate and, and what the, the straightforward algorithm, estimation algorithm is doing. Now, the idea is that we can now fill this gap with something coarser. So instead of finding this point, we find the coarser point out there this orange part, and that's going to give, that's going to, uh, to be uh, where we, we hope to gain in computation by doing this weaker estimation. Now, just to jump back a little bit to what, to, to what Sham said, so Sham is comparing this, this, this distance from this point to that point to that blue, blue distance, and he's trying to make sure that they grow uh, together, or the ratio, they actually even stay overlapping, and then Meanwhile, gain something from the fact that you're not exactly on top of it. But right now, we're just fixing our tolerance, and we're trying to fill this gap by doing something smart. So let's make this concrete. K-means problem, also known as vector quantization in information theory and signal processing. So what's the problem here? Hopefully, I don't have to really motivate it for you. Just I'm just going to set up some notation 
everybody has seen the one version of this. I'm talking particularly about the statistical, the probabilistic version of this. So we have an underlying distribution, which we will, we're trying effectively to approximate by k points. And the way we judge the performance of this approximation is by the proximity of a sample drawn from this distribution to one of the centers. And we're trying to find that our optimal, basically, is to minimize this, this risk. Anybody objects to the? This is clear, right? So undergraduate, maybe, of course, we all see this. Uh, so now, uh, this is the problem. We cannot solve it because we don't know p. What we have is access to data, as Ramon was commenting earlier. And we solve, instead, the empirical variant. So this is going to be the de facto algorithm against which I'm comparing. I'm glad sh this question was asked to Sham, and he said, well, we can perhaps do better sometimes. But now, this is the, our benchmark. So this is the, the typical thing that people do. And we, if we optimize the empirical risk, we obtain the empirically optimal centers. And these quantities can, do not have to be unique. But for now, just think that there is a unique solution here, a unique solution there. What do we know about this problem? So the empirical, this came in, statistical k-means problem. Statistically, what we know about it, in fact, Pollard in the 80s, he solved almost everything that there was to say about, the, about this problem. Convergence, com rates, asymptotic distribution, almost everything. He established it. And then computationally, what we know about this problem here on the samples is that, in general, it's hard. And there are heuristics for it. The k-means algorithm is actually Lloyd's uh, procedure to solve it. Gives you something. And often, sometimes you can show that it's really good. In the worst case, it can be also bad. And recently, there have been some polynomial time approximation schemes to show that, yes, you can solve it. If you're willing to approximate the problem, you can solve it in polynomial time. Uh, and and then, in practice, what people use is variants where uh, you smartly initialize this k-means problem, and then you can, you can have certain guarantees. So this is what we know. We're not going to commit. So the perspective I'm going to present, I'm not going to commit to a particular solver. So all that I'm going to think about is that you have some solver that, that solves this. And it has some computational. Uh, it, it offers some computational property. So we can solve this problem. And then we're going to write everything in function of that solver in the background. So, so now in this problem, what, is, what, is, what does that picture become? The truth is simply our distribution P. The model class is the class of all k centers. The best in the model is C star. The estimate, what we estimate from the data is C and hat. And what we want to find is a weaker estimate. OK, meanwhile, the modeling error is the risk of C star. The estimation error is the expected risk of and the expectation in the samples. Of the, of the empirically optimal centers, the, the difference between that and the, and the modeling error. And here, this additional term is the cost of our weakening, which hopefully will come with a gain in computation, something faster. Okay. This is a picture relatively well, well motiv motivated. So how, how do we weaken an estimation? How do we find such a point? So, Traditionally, how has it, so now let's think of this problem as just a generic risk here, going back to what uh, Sean was saying. Uh, this problem, typically, when the problem, underlying problem is convex, for example, for support vector machine, for in, in the work of Botu and Bousquet, Sharif, Schwarz, and Srebro, they try to approximately solve this using stochastic gradient descent, which is what Sham has refined. Another approach more recently was Chandrasekharan and Jordan. They created a hierarchy of uh, convex relaxation, which also allows you to, well, the solution will not be the right point, but it will be close enough to the point, and you will get some computational gain. But the caveat in all these approaches is that they really need a convex problem to work with. So what, the, but what are they doing? What they're doing is that here we're approximately solving. Here we're changing a little bit the constraint set. And what the other thing we can think about doing is to change the objective function, to approximate the objective function. And we're going to approximate this new objective function using data summarization. Nobody's asking anything. I'm not sure whether anybody is following, or, I, or it's too simple, or, or too confusing. So I, we'll carry on. OK, so sure. <laughs> Let's go back to the picture. Yeah. So, 
So all the, none of these are the, the two relaxations you talk about late, in the latest slide. None of this is changing the model class. So yes. the model class is fixed. We're fixing the model class. One possibility is you can enlarge the model class. Yes, so like that. that's also an option, yes. But those formulations were not this kind of What I'm talking about, we're fixing the model class. But definitely, it's something you can play around with. Because when you, what happens when you change the model class? What happens when you change the model class? This shrinks. So it gives you more room. But what, what increases is the estimation error. So there's a balance, which is the model selection balance, basically. The people in model selection, that's what they do. They try to balance the two things. But, so what, we're going to just complicate the problem without getting any insight if we do everything at the same time. But it can definitely be done. Model selection and computation statistics trade-offs at the same time. In fact, in the beginning, that's what I was trying to do. It got too messy, so I decided to just look at the fixed model class. Great. A great, great question. Thank you. I'll charge you later. Okay. <laughs> All right. So how are we going to this approximation? So this is the function we're trying to approximate. We can think, so this is the empirical measure. So it's associated with every sample point a weight of 1 over n. What we're going to do, by, when I say summarize the data, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw away some of these points. And I'm going to assign different weights to the remaining points. So we're going to replace effectively the empirical distribution by a weighted, by some other empirical distribution, effectively, but with different weights other than 1 over n, and with fewer points. And we're going to replace, therefore, this function by the very similar looking function where we're evaluating these distances. So this, this is the Euclidean distance. I don't know if I even said the Euclidean distance uh, at, uh, at these new points. So now we have this new function, and we optimize that new function. And we get a point, which is not the empirically optimal center. But what can we say about this new point? If we can get a guarantee, if this point at the maximum, at the op optimal, at the minimum, actually is within eta, within an approximation factor here of the, of the empirical risk there, then this construction is called a corset. So this is the definition of what people in computational geometry refer to by corsets. Now, if there are people actually working with corsets, they will say, no, this is not the definition. The definition actually requires a uniform approximation over all Cs. And then this becomes a special case. But since this is the only part I'm going to use, you can just think of this as the definition. Let's not complicate our life. So we solve this problem. We plug in, in the actual the empirical risk. So again, corset literature, everything is about the empirical risk. Okay? So one of the steps we're going to take here is to actually go from this empirical risk guarantee to the true risk, the generalization risk guarantee. So this is? So in an early diagram, it was the statistical, right? So this is a deterministic. This is a bound on every realization of xi, right? Yes, so this is not in expectation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No. This is for, yeah, but, but, but the caveat, I'm not going to, I'm hiding that a little bit. These constructions are probabilistic themselves. So with high probability, it will give you this guarantee. But now we, let's forget about that. Huh? Okay, it actually <laughs> does give you that. Okay. Um, but beyond that, no. So this, all of this literature is about actual points, and you just, just care about the points. There is no probability distribution where it's coming from. So the, you just give this guarantee on the points. So for me, this is interesting because it's about how can we approximate, when can we approximate the empirical measure for a particular task. So, but, but we're going to use this as a machinery to get this computation statistics trade-offs. But, but the core set itself is a randomized construction. Yes, yes. That's what I was saying, that this, co this guarantee is going to be only true with some probability, right? So but the question is how, how much computation does it take to compute the core set? Exactly. So, so this is the whole thing. So we have to see whether there, it actually buys us anything. So in terms of approximation, so this actually, the whole thing is a motivation of the why to do approximation anyway in the first place. So you can think of this presentation from a dual perspective where to motivate approximation, uh, uh, these kind of results, sketching, etc., because you can actually use it to balance and then get some computational gain out of it, and then, then it's, that's great. So, so how do we construct the core sets? So now I'm not going to go in detail. And in fact, I'm not a core set expert. I'm just using it as a, as a tool. For, uh, we have a bunch of points. And you want to create the summary. 
you will be first tempted to, to do uniform sampling. Now, I don't know if you guys were at Woodruff, David Woodruff's talk on Monday. He talked a little bit about this choosing the different uh, columns of a matrix. Or was it rows, rows of a matrix? And uh, so similar idea. So you would be tempted to do uniform sampling, but that's not going to give you the right kind of balance because you will typically not capture the right clusters because this clusters is going so the rare the sparse clusters are going to escape so the other idea which people use is to do important sampling and important sampling you can think of it as it's typically done in this two stage fashion but as i will say later you can actually do it in a streaming fashion also to do it online where you do a pass imagine doing a pass on the data to roughly see where the clusters are not exactly solve the problem but roughly from that you assign certain sampling frequencies to your different points and almost inversely proportionally, you assign them some weights. And then you sample based on the sampling probabilities, and you get in the end like a bunch of points here, some points there with the respective weights. And what people show is that this kind of uh, constructions actually can give you the core set guarantees. So they can actually give you a nice core set just doing this important sampling uh, approach. And what kind of properties does it have to go back to see whether we, what, are we, what properties are we going to use to extract some benefit out of it? The first thing is to see how does the approximation factor depend on the summarization size. So you can imagine with larger summaries, we get better approximation factors. Small summaries, worse approximation factors. But also this approximation factor, the summary size, is going to adversely affect the construction, the construction time. And as I said, it's typically divided into two. The first stage does not really depend on the ultimate approximation. This first stage, in fact, is, can be made in time linear in the n, k, and d, which is great. The second part only depends typically on the sampling size, that how, many, how much samples you're going to extract from your construction. What is k? k is the number of uh, centers, the, the model. So the number of centers in the k means. The k means. Uh, so, so why doesn't this depend on n? It looks like your approximation factor does not depend on n. So this you one. might as well choose n equals k, right? But this is because what? Yes, but you've suffered there. Or k equals n. But we're not messing with, we're not messing with k as we, we agreed that no, we're not messing with k. So we have fixed. S. You could choose n equals s. Yes, but then you get n, uh, you get a polynomial, you get something worse off there. n equals s. Uh, what happens when you do n equals s? Yeah, you get. You, you, yes, yes, exactly. You get an approximation, yes, it's valid. You can do that. There's nothing preventing you from doing that, but then n shows up there, which is going to screw us up if, if, we, if, we, if you do it. Yeah, there's no reason why you can't do it. OK, so this is how we can construct it. Now the question is, what does the final picture look like? So just so that we don't get lost, we have some time. Um, so we used to do data, empirical risk, solve it, get uh, empirical risk minimizers. Now we're going to summarize the data, get the core set risk, evaluate the core set risk, which now it only depends on the summarization size. We solve it, and then we get the core set centers. So what's happening here is that I'm keeping the solver the same. So you choose your solver, whatever guarantees it has, just give it to me, and I'm going to use it. And then, and then on the other hand, what you, I'm going to incur as an additional cost, in addition to this T-solver evaluated on S, I'm going to get the summarization cost, running time. So, so this is the picture we have in the end. This is what we're proposing about doing. And then let's say n, n not is the sample complexity. When we ask for a trade-off, what are we asking for? We're asking for, some, at some point beyond the sample complexity, we're asking for there to exist a summarization which will guarantee us the risk, the tolerated risk, but simultaneously do better than just truncating. Okay. So this is not, and then ultimately we want to optimize this to drive it to find the S which makes this as small as possible. But for now we want some S which actually at least goes below. Just simple truncation. So this is the problem. Can we do it? And that's where we, we arrived. So under some conditions, mild conditions, <laughs> um, well, well, they are kind of mild. Because if, you do, if, you, if your summarization is very time inefficient, okay, what's the point of, of summarizing? Or if it requires too many. So it's, let's say the summarization size, dependence on the summarization size is just the same as the dependence of the estimation error. 
then also you can end nothing. And if the solver is not sublinear or linear, then why even bother with any of this? So you just use the solver as is. So if these conditions are satisfied, then what I'm saying is that there exists a summarization, there exists summarization choices which give you the trade-off that I mentioned. This theorem sounds like a tautology, no? Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Good it does. A, good thing B, good thing C all happens, and then you have a good thing happening at the end. The C's yeah. Can you yes. the conditions in any example? Exactly. So this is where... Do you think for perspective improving? So that's why I'm saying that <laughs> these conditions, but, if, if, but on the other hand, it's also, the converse is also true. If they break, you also can't do anything. So if they're verified, you hope to do something. If they break, you also do not hope to do something. So then I can tell you a little bit about the detail here. We're saying the summarization error is dominated by the solver time, running time, I'm sorry. And here we're saying that the approximation factor is growing slower than, let's say you plug in S there with estimation error. And then here there is a caveat about the, the, the risk should be small enough and the sample size should be large enough. But that's the interesting regime, actually. But what's interesting, of course, is that these are satisfied. These conditions can be verified to be satisfied by existing corset constructions. So now it, this is interesting. Now we can say trade-offs exist. And we get excited. And then we realize that what does it really mean that the trade-off exists? So it means that there is, there is the summarization size. But we don't know exactly what it is. There is. OK? It may depend on the model. Can we actually get it? So what it means is that, going back to our picture and our nice flat line there, it means that if I fix the data size, there are a whole bunch of summarizations, and some of which are going to go down below that. So that means that there is some uh, achievable running time re regime that, uh, which is determined by the, by the summarization size. But and it means that an oracle could potentially find and tell me, oh, hey, here you are, summarize it at this level. And if you summarize it at this level, you get the Pareto front, the lower Pareto front, which is actually giving you the trade-off that you desire. But can we get it? Can we get that right summarization? So this is the, the next thing to ask. Can we approach this optimal trade-off in some sense? Maybe not optimal. Yeah. Does it really look like this? Because I would think that it would start going up again if you make the data too. Yeah, low. OK, excellent. So let's see. Uh, we allow all the procedures to, 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 uh, to, to truncate at some point if they want to. Never, by definition, it looks like this. Yeah. Huh? By definition, it looks like this. So, by definition, in some sense, but but you, you it's a power that your, your procedure will has, okay? And you factor in. So now, right now, I'm not talking about truncating. I'm just talking about summarization. You can you really can truncate, summarize, go ahead. Because anyway, there was the NKD thing, and the N was going to grow eventually. So you're right. right. So information theorist question. Okay. Yeah. Is this curve an achievable curve, or is there some is there a fundamental low <laughs> Well, if the <laughs> We really should. But actually, it's true. I think I think I saw one paper on corsets in information theory transactions. I haven't read it yet, but I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, is this curve like for a particular procedure, or? I yeah. So this is for the oracle. So it's an oracle. So in, in a priori, we don't know whether any procedure, actual procedure, can get it, but we want to do something, something more interesting than just guessing. And this is actually a question about the batches which we increase comes, comes in. So what we can do, the natural thing, what which we can do is we can start with a summarization, which is very small, which is not going to give you the epsilon tolerance that you want. And what we're going to do is that we're going to increase. We do something, that's a simple exploration of the summarization space, where we, try, we start with some base summarization, and then we grow it. And at every step, we test whether we, we have the risk or not. So it's a very natural thing to do. And then we, in the end, so I'll tell you exactly how we increase the summarization size. And this test risk, technically, we have to assume validation data, but practically, we just use some of the data for validation. And, uh, and here, the, the growth should be somehow, should, 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 should mimic what your solver, your solver's complexity. So you have to, in order to balance the, the, the growth in time with the growth, with the, so you see, it will, it will give you some kind of geometric factor in front of the optimal time basically, if you, if you do it this way. And uh, in the end, we return, when, when the test passes, we return a set of centers. This test will depend on some kind of probability uh, parameter that you have. And we can show this. We can show something which is not too exciting, we, because we suffer, like if you take the arithmetic 
the, the cost in terms of arithmetic operation, we're actually squaring compared to the optimal time. So it's, it's, not, it's not perhaps great, but it still has the kind of, so this is the analysis that we, we did. It still eventually gives you the, a certain uh, uh, risk. What does it look like in practice? In practice, uh, so this is with synthetic data. With synthetic data using some spherical Gaussians, we do it. And we actually re remarkably close to, that, to the cartoon pictures that, that, that I'm showing. So we, this, is the, this is the truncation. This is uh, the oracle. And here we find these points by searching over a whole bunch of summarizations. So this actually is hard to find the black and, and, and red curves. But the blue curve is what the algorithm gets, this, this tram, this trade-off navigation algorithm. And if we do it now on real data, something funny happens with this black line. It's not flat anymore, and this is because the data is not really IID. I can tell you why uh, offline. We go, but, but, but then we, we search summarization, we get this, and then Trump says, latches to it pretty well. Doesn't really look like it's squaring the time, but uh, so it's latching pretty well. And uh, this is some protein, sorry, this is some protein data, this is some seismic uh, detection data, and this is, this we ran it on, so everything I present to you is, is k-means, k-means plus plus. And then, but you can do the same concept just to show that it's an actually generalized, like the concept is generalizable, so you can actually go it in different ways. And since there are core sets for, for uh, Gaussian uh, mixture models, we ran, we ran it on in this Yahoo WebScope data, and then we got very similar performance. So in the end, we get three choices for the practitioner. Either they can use their entirety of the data, takes forever to do it, but then it gives you very marginal gain in, 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 in the tolerated error. Or they can, they, can, they can fix the risk and discard some of the data, but then how do you do this exactly? Or you can use this exploration and summarization and solve it, and then you get some kind of guarantee and, some, and nice practical behavior. Uh, just to wrap up now, uh, so what we've done is that we have, cre we have created this paradigm of how to get computation the statistics trade-offs using corset summarization, and we can navigate this trade-off, not just show that it exists. And corsets are, uh, I described to you this two-step process, but they're actually very parallelizable and streamable. And, uh, and then it also, they include the space element in addition to time and risk, and which we can actually explore in all kinds of, on all variety of ways. So I told you one this, this way of how you can fix funding, vary something, and tune another space, but you can actually imagine exploring the space in many different ways. But what's annoying is that corset, to find the right corsets for different problems is kind of hard. So, and this is the direction which I think is very promising to sign, somehow find generic corsets which work across, across the board somehow. Okay, that's it. Computational lower bounds. Yeah, I, but lower, no, I mean, yeah, lower bounds to the amount of computation that you need uh, to achieve a certain epsilon precision. In terms of, uh, so there are there are lower bounds in terms of uh, the act the, the, the on the points themselves if you want to solve it. So that's why we can say it's NP hard, etc. But but in terms of if you allow yourself to trade off computational statistics, I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe one more concrete question would be in your of the curve, if you were to give yourself infinite data, yeah. would you ever be able to drive the to zero. to zero? No. So eventually, so these pictures, these pictures, uh, I don't, so, no, because there is the modeling error, you, you, you uh, no. Okay, it's, it's not a simple no, so there is a justification behind it, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, but the reason is that at some point you have so much data that really there's no point in looking. Basically, you have the distribution function. And then there is some computation associated with just looking at the distribution and then finding the answer, right? So you cannot really get to zero in terms of computation. You get to some plateau. And then actually, Cerebro and the others have called this the, the data-laden regime. So you have a lot of data. And then before, it's the data, what is the word? Data laden, data scarce, like that's called. The, uh, data scarce regime, data laden regime, and in the middle, middle, something interesting happens. It's the intermediate regime. That's a good question. Uh, related to the um, irascible, for the k-means problem, yeah. how much does the corset result that you quoted uh, dependent on the Euclidean? Did I mention D? 
No, no, the, the, the oh, metric was Euclidean. <coughs> yes, 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 Euclidean. To what extent is that course that results uh, dependent on that? So it depends because now if you want to go to k-median in general, you have to prove the entire a whole bunch of new course results. So there are some generic methods this by criteria approximation methods uh, by Feldman. So that paper that I said, the 2011 stock paper, they talk about how can you generally prove, but you have to prove it again. I mean, they tell you how to do it, but then you change the metric, you have to prove it again. So it would be nice to do it without having to prove it again every time. So have you looked at these for convex optimization problems where you can put numbers and rates and so on to all these different terms and compare? Um, no. But uh, so I think in the convex problems, you would do something like sketching, maybe then course that. So I imagine if we, if we lift the results from what people do in sketching, maybe we can, get, we can do that. But no, I haven't done it. I just, I just, just looked at the K-means problem. I, it wasn't even clear whether we we're going to gain anything, even here. So it was, I was happy to see that, yes, something happens. Not just by theory, also, also on the data that we're, we're collecting. So your summarization involves randomization, right? Uh, yes. So, yes. So imagine everything I presented is conditioned on the event that the core set is good. So, so is there some meta result saying that to really achieve better trade-offs than, you know, looking at all the data and doing the empirical obvious thing, you would always need randomization? I don't think I don't think so. Actually, it would be nice to have none. I, there might. I think I've seen a couple of results about non-randomized corset constructions. You just have to replace this selection that you're doing this uh, with some kind of. Yeah, I'm not really sure, because you, you explore, you decide that oh, these places I have to sample more, these places I have to sample less. But then, all, all the analysis relies on the nice probabilistic properties that you get from the sampling. And then you have to replace that. You have to de-randomize somehow. I'm not sure. So related question. So what if you tried a few rounds of soft S means and use that as the core set? Uh, well, that's almost like the truncation. So I, yes, you're adding a little bit by. It's not exactly truncation because soft. If, if you do a few rounds of soft S means, still you're getting a more representative sample than just a... It's, it's a good suggestion. I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know what, what to say. No, but it's interesting. Okay.